If you enjoyed the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentreview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. Matt, when did you become interested in aviation? I guess my interest uh, in aviation was uh, nothing special compared to uh, any other young kid uh, in my childhood, but um, it was kind of a, you know, a coincidence more or less that uh, I ended up in the Air Force flying uh, F-16. I was, um, after gymnasium, uh, I went to the army for a two year period uh, to become a reserve officer. And uh, at the end of that tour, I saw like a poster uh, in the cafeteria saying, uh, become a pilot in the Air Force. And I looked at it and I could see it looked pretty cool, in fact, with this uh, helmet and dark visor and another fighter uh, laying beside um, the cockpit there. And I, I told, thought by myself that uh, why not just uh, send in my application before I became I become a, a, an old man and uh, sitting there uh, missing out uh, the joy of uh, flying uh, F-16. So I just um, I sent my application. I went to all the tests and 30 years later, I'm here. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. So can you talk us through some of your initial training? I mean, what aircraft did you fly, uh, you know, going through this process before you went on to a frontline aircraft? Yeah, in the Danish Air Force, uh, we start at uh, the flying school, and it's a period of approximately four months where we fly the T-17 supporter, which is a, a single engine prop, um, but fully, uh, full aerobatic uh, capable. And that's, you know, the flying school, it's, it's not, I mean, everybody can pretty much learn to fly, but um, uh, at the flying school, you're being push pretty hard um, and so uh, the instructors would like to see how, how do you behave when you get in in the vicinity of not being uh, able to uh, cope with everything so uh, it's very basic it starts and start and landing and basic uh, aerobatics uh, as far as i remember we were flying a little bit of instrument also just uh, getting a touch of it um, and some uh, navigation stuff so it was I can't remember the number of the rides, maybe uh, around 30 rides, I guess, uh, for this uh, selection of um, who uh, should go on uh, and who should uh, should leave the program at that time. And um, I think about half of the students uh, were kicked out uh, during that period at the flying school. And after that, um, I went to uh, Shepard Air Force Base in Texas the United Joint Jet Pilot Training, uh, class 9305. Uh, and besides us five Danes, uh, we had um, some British guys. We had some guys from the uh, Netherlands and uh, German guys and, of course, Americans. And uh, that course was uh, 13 months. I think they, initially we had one month of uh, uh, yeah, academics and aerospace. For surely, and uh, after that, we had um, one year flying T thirty seven, the tweet, um, and again uh, the contact phase starting and landing and stuff. And um, I got a, a little story there. My my um, solo check out. In fact, after like fourteen rides, I was uh, trying to convince my instructor that I was good enough uh, to. Uh, be let loose on my own, so um, we're letting <laughs> um, making a lot of uh, landing patterns there, and it, I'm I'm just doing perfect and setting up for the last landing, uh, uh, and uh, after that I should be uh, raised to go solo. 
and they're rolling out on final um, cooter, which the equivalent to the um, the tower comes up on the frequency. I say, hey, final, go around, no gear. So um, of course that wasn't good enough to go solo. Uh, I forgot to lower the gear, and had to make a, a remake for that before I could uh, progress in the program. But um, luckily enough, it was my only boss at Shepherd. Um, after uh, the contact phase, we had instrument, we had uh, navigation, uh, of course, without a GPS. At that time, it was 92. Uh, we were flying a two ship formation. And after that half year um, ended, uh, we were skipped on to a T 38 Talon, which was more fighter like, you know, with the IP in the back seat uh, and uh, landing with 250 knots or whatever. No, I guess. Uh, Probably 150 knots compared to the uh, T37. It was um, everything was faster and higher. Uh, I think a loop was around 10,000 feet in um, the T38, and uh, the add-ons there were were we had the navigation part also, but that was flown as a two ship, and we had uh, four ship formation uh, on the 38. But it was it was a joy. I think it was a very interesting time to be. Um, you know, away from home, really, for, for the first time, like uh, a period of a year. And uh, being there with um, guys from other countries, struggling to get through the program. Um, so it was a lot of ho hard work, um, but also, uh, like, the horizon was just expanding enormously uh, during that 13-month uh, period. Yeah, it sounds like you had a great time there. But can you remember, did you know what squadron you were going to go on to back in, back in Denmark? Or did you, or was that still up in the air at the time? You know, at, at that time, it was, uh, I mean, the Cold War has just ended a, a few years earlier. And, and uh, we had like six fighter squadrons in Denmark. We had um, two uh, F-35 uh, Dragon, a Swedish fighter bomber squadrons at Kau. And we had two F-16 squadrons in Aalborg and two uh, F-16 squadrons at Skrydstrup. And at that time, uh, the, the Dragon uh, was, was uh, I mean, I think the last flight of the, one of the squadrons was in 93. So it was about to be uh, cut at that time. So I knew I had to go back to a fly F-16, uh, which was nice. And since I'm from Copenhagen and uh, the two uh, air bases in Jutland, I, I didn't really have any sense of what Jutland was. But luckily enough, I went to to the northern part to uh, Aalborg, where I was uh, converted uh, in the 723 squadron to fly F-16. And that was also like, uh, I, re I remember the, the biggest difference was um, the trust the engine had. Um, Compared to what what we were what we used to at uh, at Shepard Air Force Base, and on my uh, initial uh, dollar ride, uh, getting out there and you know turn and burn and nineties and all that stuff, I had to uh, puke in my uh, flying glove at the end of that oh. mission. It's just I was <laughs> totally soaked and uh, overwhelmed by what the F sixteen was capable of. Um, and then we had one year uh, converting and and now of course uh, flying has had to be secondary for you since you had to be using uh, the aircraft as a weapon platform so initial uh, start landing uh, instrument formation stuff was a fairly short period and then we had those two big blocks of um, air to air and uh, air to ground and in 93, uh, we were still, it was kind of still basic. F-16 was still pretty much the same as we um, received in the uh, uh, beginning of the 80s. So we had, of course, the internal um, uh, 20 millimeter uh, cannon for air to air. And then we had um, heat seeking missiles, uh, the AM-9 uh, Lima. So it was all, I mean, it was all, all, all flying air to air wise was uh, basic fighter maneuvers, advanced combat maneuvers. So all in a visual arena, uh, doing nineties, uh, pretty much every day. So it was kind of a, a you know, uh, a, a up to date battle of Britain, uh, dogfight uh, scenario, half of the flying at that time, all in close. Um, so it was really your, your, your flying skills. That was, um, was the prime. Uh, 
concern when uh, to achieve your success in, in flying the F-16 at that time. And the other part uh, we were converted to was, of course, the air-to-ground part. When, and again, we had we had rockets at that time, CF-7 um, rockets, like uh, two big pots we could carry. I mean, no, I think we could carry four, in fact. Uh, so a bunch of rockets, uh, again, in close, uh, of course, exposed for all kind of stuff being shot at you from the ground. And then we had um, Mark 82s and Mark 84s, uh, like the 2,000 pound um, general purpose bomb and a uh, uh, 250 pounds uh, general purpose bomb. And again, uh, non guided, it was just storm bombs. So uh, you had to be pretty or fairly close to your targets to um, achieve success. And, and uh, I mean, just to um, uh, add the odds up, we were normally carrying six bombs, uh, dropping a string just to make sure that something uh, hit in the vicinity of uh, where it was supposed to hit. But there was a lot of flying at that time. I mean, your flying skills was really, really, really important to achieve success uh, flying a fighter at that time due to the lack of uh, technology, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I mean, any... did you, uh, did, sorry about that, Emmett. Uh, did you uh, interact with other F-16 nations? Did you swap notes, as it were, or were you singly, like, Denmark was its own thing? No, we, you know, we had the EPAF, um, European Participating Air Forces, which was uh, Norway and uh, Netherlands and uh, Belgium. We were the, the four nations that bought F-16 first, after the you know, US, of course, and, and we had kind of worked together uh, since then. But in the beginning, I, I remember the first um, uh, rotation I had, uh, or we were receiving during my conversion was uh, 25 squadron coming from leaving, flying the Tornado F3. And I was quite thrilled to to see those guys um, coming to Aalborg, which is a pretty nice university city with a, a good uh, party life. Um, so. I remember thinking, uh, running around with uh, characters like uh, um, a guy called Parky, who is kind of a legend in the Royal Air Force, I guess, but saying, okay, I want to I wanna be like them. I want to fly hard and party hard and, and just uh, adopt that uh, lifestyle. So that was kind of an eye-opening for me. Um, but then, uh, of course, we've been working a lot together, often flying with the Norwegians, since we are next door to each other, flying in the, in the sea between Norway and Denmark, air to air. And we also done that uh, with the, the Dutch guys once in a while. But in the beginning, in the in the 90s, we, we were going on a lot of um, squadron rotations, visiting other squadrons that were visiting us. And we had um, kind of a big exercise in Denmark also called Tactical Fighter Weaponry once a year, where a lot of... Uh, uh, NATO squadrons came to Denmark and, and uh, flew in the western part where we have a big range dropping uh, bombs and we had all kind of um, SAM sites, um, surf time missiles uh, standing along the coast. It was, it was pretty uh, high activity at that, um, that point. I guess it was kind of the leftovers from, um, from the Cold War. We're not being uh, uh, cut all the way down as uh, pretty much are now. What do you think the F-16, I guess, does well and not so well, in your opinion? I think F-16 is a, uh, a marvelous uh, aerodynamic uh, wonder, I guess. Um, it's really, uh, you, the cockpit, first of all, you're like tilted 30 degrees in your ACES-2 ejection seat, and um, you have a wonderful view. Uh, there's no canopy bow in front of you, which you see in a lot of other aircrafts. And... Uh, and it's, it's, it feels like uh, kind of strapping the jet onto you. Um, and then uh, when it's clean, having no bombs or external tanks, it's, I mean, you can just accelerate uh, a low level uh, after takeoff to around 600 knots and pull the nose up and you just continue to 30,000 feet. Wow. And um, flying wise, uh, maneuverability, it's it's still one of the best uh, aircraft to to fly um, air to air combat in i think absolutely and one of our favorite subjects on this channel is dact so i'm guessing you fought everything 
you know, in the NATO inventory and even the Americans. So how did the F-16 uh, fare against, you know, the F-15, uh, Tornado F-3, all them kind of things? Yeah, well, the first, my first experience was, in fact, flying uh, in the backseat of a Tornado F-3 with the Parky and uh, against some, some of my uh, squadron colleagues. And we're kind of merging with uh, an F-16 and making the first half, half a turn. And then Parky comes up on intercom and says, yeah, and that's where we die. Because, I mean, there was no doubt and it's kind of fun to sit in another aircraft to see how maneuverability, how, how, how good the maneuverability was on F-16 compared to Tornado F-3, which never really was designed as a, a, a dogfighter, I guess. So, so uh, that, that, that was my first uh, really uh, experience of DACT. Um, and I, of course, I tried to fly the F-16 against the F, uh, F-3 also. So it was not it was not a fair fight if you could. I wouldn't uh, uh, categorize it as a fair fight at least. Um, yeah. But um, I've flown against uh, Mirage 2000. Uh, it's only also fairly capable yet. And we have some advantages, some in, in spectral of speed and altitude, and they have some, some advantages in other spectrums of uh, speed and altitude so uh, again it comes to uh, when it comes to dsdg uh, you really have to be aware of um, where are you your jet good uh, where 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 should you be and in, in what uh, speed frame should you um, try to operate and and what altitude would you like to take your opponent to to have the uh, advantage um but then again a, a I tried a lot of jets, you know, also flying against the uh, sea harriers and uh, uh-huh. all kind of other stuff. Uh, I guess uh, I, I wouldn't like to uh, meet a rat today because uh, in a, a DACT closed in, uh, they would probably be uh, outmaneuvering us. But we still have a, a, a fairly good chance and some advantage uh, compared to F-35. Of course, they have some some um, uh, advantage in, in uh, larger AOA, but but it's a, a fairly heavy aircraft compared to F-16 and, and bleed speed um, faster than we do, in my opinion. Was the program called MLU? When did that get introduced into the Danish Air Force? Uh, yeah, MLU, it was uh, in ninety mid-90s uh, to the end of the 90s. Uh, after, uh, and uh, I, I was, after the conversion, I went to 723 Squadron in, in Aalborg. And 723 Squadron was um, getting the responsibility to uh, implement a midlife update in the Air Force. And at that time, um, commercial airlines has just opened up and, you know, sucked a lot of pilots from from, from uh, the Danish Air Force. Mm-hmm. So I guess we were like five, six pilots uh, left in 723 Squadron. And I was still kind of the youngest, but was... Um, uh, and natural reasons uh, lifted in the system uh, due to the lack of other pilots. So I was one of the guys who was uh, getting in charge of um, the conversion, and uh, it was it was pretty interesting. It, it, you know, the the old F sixteen uh, we had prior to that was very basic. We had, um, I mean, we had a, a screen which could show the the radar, and that was it. And now suddenly a midlife update, we get a multifunction displays that can give us a lot of uh, different information. The, um, you know, God's eye view uh, seen from above we can have uh, target port pictures um, beside all the other stuff. And uh, so when you look at the aircraft from the outside, you can pretty much only um, see that we've got uh, four antennas in front of the canopy for AFF uh, interrogation. And then uh, they moved the landing light from the main gear to the nose gear. That's pretty much it when, when you look uh, f- uh, from the outside of it yet. But, but the cockpit was uh, totally redesigned. Um, so besides that, we, we, um, with the midlife update, we got the AMRAMS, the advanced medium range air to air missile. It was first the radar missiles we got. So, so air to air combat uh, also changed for us to also include the beyond visual range engagement, which was uh, a new philosophy and um, also another way of flying. So now you didn't have to pull 90s every time you were flying uh, air-to-air combat. And um, we also got 
uh, the capability of uh, uh, dropping JDAMs only to get the tail kit and and those kits for for the old uh, Mark eighty uh, twos and Mark eighty four um, bomb bodies and uh, suddenly we could drop uh, GPS bombs from high altitudes and again uh, even though I think it didn't we didn't get the uh, target pod right away uh, when we uh, got uh, midlife update uh, a few years uh, went on. But then we got target pot also, so we were capable of um, lacing bombs. So it was a, a big change in capability. Uh, of course, a lot, lot more um, uh, computer power was added to the aircraft. Uh, I guess the old Commodore 64 was um, thrown out and uh, we got a Pentium Quantro Corp uh, instead. So a lot of um, computer power was added. Uh, so. It was a game changer in the way we were operating uh, the F-16, that's, that's for sure. And, and, and for the better, and it, it was definitely needed if if uh, F-16 was supposed to fly uh, uh, till today, uh, because uh, if we hadn't done that, it would have been uh, an old uh, platform, not capable of uh, fighting the wars we are fighting today. And was all that work done in-house, or was it sent back to America to get updated? Uh, we made the, uh, uh, the change, as I remember, was pretty much made in, in Denmark or at least Europe. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure for, we didn't send any jets to the States for, for that update. But of course, I went, I went there a couple of months to, to um, kind of being in charge of the, the new uh, midlife update simulator, which also was a huge uh, jump in, in technology compared to what we we're used to the old F-16 simulator was kind of a black screen with the uh, light dots on uh, simulating a, a runway, uh, no no visual arena wow. like uh, you used to today. And remember a nice feature with that old simulator was to simulate uh, the T-force, the, the seat cushion was uh, inflated with air. So you <laughs> kind of felt like you were being pressed down to the seat, but that was as, as far as technology went at that time. Um, and then the midlife update simulator, um, we bought that from Raytheon, I guess. Um, it, it was also like, suddenly you were not only uh, in the old simulator, you could uh, pretty much only train uh, emergencies, but suddenly you were able to, to uh, train uh, kind of tactical scenarios, um, even though the visual wasn't uh, HD or anything like that, but uh, still doable for for getting a feel of how real life was. Not like today, the simulators we have today is pretty much real life, um, visually at least. Yeah, and obviously uh, from your bio you sent over, it sounds like you've flown, was it 100 missions um, in live theater? Can you tell us about this? And did you feel like the F-16 was still a potent, um, you know, weapon for the Danes? Yeah, uh, first time I was, uh, going abroad was uh, during the Balkan war, I think it was 99. And I was there with the uh, midlife update. The whole fleet wasn't wasn't uh, converted to midlife update at that time. So the aircraft we had at the uh, Aalborg, where our station was uh, midlife update. And the ones we had in uh, the Southern base, Skrudstrup uh, wasn't. So going there, we, we were stationed north of uh, Naples uh, at Grazinese, it was called together with um, uh, Norwegian F-16s. And it was like, it was the first time, uh, I, you know, it, for me, it was kind of hard to see who's the really, who's the bandits down there. I thought, I thought uh, everybody pretty much on Balkan was trying to uh, do awful things um, to each other. And it was the first time the Danish Air Force was, was going to war. So it was kind of, okay, um, we'll, we'll fly air defense. Uh, so put up some caps and stuff, um, the dropping bomb things, we, we let, let that uh, to the Americans and, and the Dutch and stuff, stuff. So we flew a lot of combat air patrols, long missions, uh, but I, I never really experienced anything. We never saw a, a Serbian jet go airborne or had any engagements. And once in a while you could see some some uh, unguided uh, SA-6 being shot uh, in the air, but at a distance. So it was kind of, you know, uh, the big new thing for me was long missions, a lot of air refueling, 
uh, being over more or less uh, hostile uh, territory, going back to Gratinés, and then we, you know, we were of course uh, staying at a, a beach hotel together with Norwegians. Uh, there was a bit of barbed wire and, and stuff, but down in the pool, uh, having a pina colada after flying a seven-hour mission was kind of it was kind of odd, you know. Um, but I. I I'll address that to to uh, it was so new also for for the Danish um, defense to to go aboard. We were we were supposed to uh, to handle ourselves and uh, fight the the Vashava um, Pact if they were coming. So it was kind of odd, but but uh, I, I guess we we learned a lot in in the Air Force and um, uh, also learned uh, nice things with the uh, midlife update compared to the old platform. We were able to interrogate, you know. So it was always also always nice for the guys that were flying the old old F-16 to fly with one of the midlife updates. So we can at a long distance say, okay, that is the the uh, air refuel assets flying there because we could interrogate his mode three and stuff and had a way better essay of uh, where we were due to the GPS in the aircraft, which was not in the old F-16, and also the uh, the uh, Gaza view of. Uh, of how, how it all looked with areas and every fuel areas and tracks and stuff. So um, definitely a, a, a big improvement in uh, situational awareness, awareness having uh, the F-16 uh, with us at that time. But again, it was kind of, it was kind of a, uh, you know, small steps for, for the Danish Air Force and uh, to see what, what is this uh, thing called war. So um, I had like, yeah, I can't remember, maybe uh, one and a half months in total, I guess, um, during that conflict. And um, the the things we experienced was not related to war, it was more like flying experience. Uh, I remember uh, the only th only time in, in my period um, going away as a lead and not bringing my wing back was um, down there where he got a generator failure and had to uh, land at uh, Sarajevo. Uh, so I had to go back on my own. That was kind of a a weird feeling um, I remember, but um, that wasn't it. Wasn't that dramatic uh, flying at uh, Balkan for us at least? Yes. Yeah, so what other live uh, theaters did you actually fly in, and did you personally feel all the training got you to this point, and were you ready for this? Yes, I think so. Uh, you know, uh, we were we were not having a target pot at that time. We had, we did not drop uh, laser guided bombs, uh, so. It was still all the basic stuff. Uh, we had the F um, uh, MM, so so we were able to to do PBR uh, employments, and I felt pretty uh, comfortable uh, in in that theater myself because uh, I've been one of the first guys flying midlife update, so I was one of the guys with the most experience on, on the new platform. So since we were converting the rest of the air force, I was we were flying quite a lot at that time. So. Mm. I felt I was I was pretty um, pretty comfortable, even though I can see years later, you know, the capabilities we had that we didn't have at that time uh, was like another big step forward. So, but I mean, what you don't know, you don't know. So, so I guess what we had at that time, it, I was I was feeling fairly comfortable going away. And what was it like working with other nations? Was the integration quite easy there? Yeah, it is. And, and again, you know, Norwegian is one of the other uh, EPAF partners. So we have a lot of uh, cooperation going on there. So uh, we saw the same um, next time we went away was in Afghanistan. We went with Norwegians and the, the Dutch. Uh, so again, I mean, it's, it's uh, more or less plug and play when we go out together because we have a, a lot of strings crossing uh, each other on, on all kind of levels um, in the Air Force. And that's, yeah, okay. Uh, of course, uh, being on a base with the, the U.S. Air Force is also a big uh, force multiplier for us because they have all the things we don't. So if anything is missing, we can all also go always go to them and and uh, get things fixed uh, pretty much. But, um, you know, the, the F-16 community uh, that we were used to hang out with, later on, the Portuguese also came. But uh, it, it's, it's a pretty good... Um, unity uh, we have there. So what was the social side of it um, like uh, in live theater, live operations? 
was it could you have like downtime or were you always on alert was you always uh, your mind racing um i remember we had like one uh, stand down day i think they called it uh, where we went to rome uh, being tourists uh, so it's it's not uh, when you're away like six weeks or something you might have one stand down day um and I, I just like to go out and experience things. And I, I remember going to Monte Cassino, in fact, uh, again, bet between the Evils and, uh, and Rome, uh, seeing uh, the old monastery where a, a lot of battle went on during Second World War, a big uh, graveyard for, for uh, the Polish soldiers who died there. So mm -hmm. I, normally I, I, I used to go and see uh, what's, what's, in the vicinity when we have those stand down days um but then again it was it was kind of odd you know to to stay at a a beach hotel when you were <laughs> at war. Yeah. i mean with a there's a bar and there's a uh, swimming pool and uh, you know go to the local pizza man and, and get some spaghetti olio aglio pepperoncini and you know it wasn't it wasn't what i expected of of uh, going to war I must admit, but they came later on. Yeah, so can you maybe share one or two stories that maybe stick out in your mind from uh, flying on live operations or going to war? Yeah, well, the next time we went away was was uh, after 9-11. Um, and that was kind of a, I guess, a shock for, for a lot of people. Um, uh, I was definitely thinking it, it was the right thing we were doing at that time. Uh, there was a reaction needed and uh, pretty much a year after 9-11, uh, 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 2001, uh, we were, I found myself in um, Kyrgyzstan uh, at Manas Air Base, or is it Kyrgyzstan? I can't remember what it's called, that nation. Anyway, um, and we were there with the uh, Norwegians and uh, the Dutch uh, having, I think we had, did we have? six six aircraft each there i think i can't remember anyway and i i flew the uh, first mission into afghanistan it was that was um i mean you were far away you were very far away it took like one hour a uh, transit uh, just to wow. get into afghanistan from where we based yeah and it was uh, the north well, northwestern part of um, himalaya so you know, you had you had like twenty meters flying from uh, Osh to Dushanbe, uh, where you couldn't contact anybody. You, I mean, there were no no uh, no nothing man made anywhere. Just flying there above those uh, high mountains. Uh, uh, I mean, you could feel pretty uh, pretty alone there. Uh, the only thing you had was your your wingman flying at, at your side, but uh, nobody was talking to you. You couldn't see any man-made light pretty much um except for the strobe of course from from the wingman and then into to afghanistan and you know what what is uh, you, you didn't really know what to expect um but it showed out that it was a lot of um, long missions we were flying um, a lot of loitering a lot of air refueling um a lot of uh, show of presence uh, often was enough to get um, things cooled down on the ground uh, but Denmark was also at that time really I mean taking maybe a, a further step now it's okay to go to war and now we had this uh, we had this talking pot so we we're able to drop uh, GPU 12 laser guided bombs now on our own um, and uh, so during the day we were we were doing okay but during night uh, we did not have um, night vision goggles as, as the only ones the Norwegians and the Dutch had it so we were like us you were seeking for a needle in a haystack uh, during night um, with that straw of um, of vision you had uh, through your targeting pot um, and then uh, a lot of trouble was uh, was often along the border to pakistan and we had like uh, uh, from our are saying we could not under any circumstances go across the border if there were troubles there and you know, nobody really knew where that, that border exactly were, but but it could be kind of frustrating uh, being there, being able to help um, guys on the ground. And, ah, oh, you're the Danish F-16s. Okay, 
In that case, we call for some ATNs from background instead. So, but then again, we, we're just a, a, a political tool and, and you just have to, um, to cope with the, the ROEs you have and, and don't, don't let them spoil your day, uh, I guess. So, so it, it was a lot of flying, a long missions. Um, and it, it took a, quite a while before we were, we were engaged in, in uh, some uh, hot stuff. I was, in fact, it was the first uh, hot close air support engagement for the Royal Danish Air Force. Um, that I was uh, a part of um, first uh, strafing with the gun at a uh, hillside, couldn't really see anything. Um, you know, it uh, looked like maybe an entrance of a, a cave or something, but nothing man made. Again, no people, no nothing. And after that, dropping a, a GPO 12, which was my first engagement in, in war. So I had this experience of being um, totally totally there. I mean, you, your, your body was just um, acting on years of training, um, muscle memory was doing all the right things and, and the subconscious was was pretty much running the show. And I had a feeling that it was it was good to see that what you've been trained to, you were able to to uh, do real life and um, do it as it, it was supposed to be done. Um, I just remember being so soaked in sweat up after that. Um, and I, yeah. in fact, asked my uh, wingman, hey, isn't it uh, hot today? Well, it's just as hot as any other day in Afghanistan. You're just uh, psyched up with adrenaline, I guess. So, yeah, uh, yeah. but that was that was my only uh, drop of bombs in, in Afghanistan. And it was pretty, I think in total, uh, the Royal Danish Air Force dropped 16 bombs. So it wasn't. It wasn't um, that wild, I guess. It was kind of quiet being there, flying a lot, show of presence, uh, just being ready. Long, long missions. Uh, I remember the, the worst enemy was was uh, fatigue. Um, mm. We couldn't use uh, uppers or downers. Uh, I don't know, can't remember the reason, but what we had there um, had nothing really to, to save us. And I remember, in fact, being so tired in, in a, uh, flying in a every full track, just heading south and then waking up by the tanker going north and me on on my way into Pakistan. Um, so it was all you know, the biggest enemy just to stay awake on those long missions. So maybe the wrong word is say enjoy, but did you, were you proud of your time flying on live operations? Yeah, I was, uh, even though I, I remember feeling, I, I, in fact, I was a Danish guy who flew the most in Afghanistan, but after almost five months in, in three different tours, I remember going home the last time, not really feeling that we, we changed that much. And also remember being uh, kind of disappointed when, when I was there uh, sitting, uh, I remember in the chow hall one day and, oh, now the uh, American in start the invasion of Iraq. Oh, damn it. Mm. Now, you know, a lot of resources is, uh, is being pulled from Afghanistan. Um, and kind of, I think that was kind of, yeah, really a, a stupid uh, wrong thing to do, but I only realized that years later anyway, but um, I still felt it was right at that time, what we were doing in Afghanistan. I think we had to do it. Uh, um, but I mean, uh, just hoping that time would uh, would would uh, do us good and, and change that country from medieval to yeah. I think it would be naive to say dem democracy, but but something um, more more yeah doable for the people on the ground. Mm -hmm.